all of you that are watching online this morning, our online family, thank you so much for joining us each and every week. We're going to have an amazing, amazing time in the Word this morning. How many of you guys are ready for God's Word? Amen. Amen. Before we dive in, I do want to say a huge thank you, not only to Sean um, Hunt for putting together the promo video, the post video, but Freedom Fest this year was probably the best Freedom Fest we have ever had in the history of Mountain River Church, and we've been doing it since the first year in 2007. So this Freedom Fest, yeah. we had 30 first-time guests, first time they'd ever stepped foot on Mountain River's property. That was awesome. We also had almost 170 that were here on the place. And you know, after the event was over, we had multiple people come up to us and just say, you guys put on the best events. You guys do spectacular. We could not do that if it wasn't for our amazing serve team and all the people who were here till 11 o'clock at night building horseshoe pits in the dark with headlights and getting everything just perfect. So just a huge thank you across the board to everybody who cooked and served and shot off fireworks and put your life on the line out there <laughs> Absolutely. for this event to be we, awesome. We could not do it without you. How many of you guys ever really feel the frustration of life weighing you down? May I see your hand, please? I think all of us, all of us can probably relate to that. All of us from one time or another, we are experiencing frustration like never ever before. And I want to tell you, the Word of God has something to share about frustration and about the, the weight of life that weighs us down. But um, I want to share a story real quick before I get going into this message that I think is going to maybe kind of just provide some momentum to this lesson for us this morning. And, and, and I'm reminded of a time, and it just so happens that it is around, you know, Independence Day as, as I'm thinking about this story. Uh, one day, Misty and I, this was back in our early days of our relationship, back in Bible college, and we were going down Main Street in Joplin, and we were, we were heading down Main Street, and we passed this fireworks factory. I don't know if it was a factory, I think it was a distribution plant. It just a huge, huge warehouse, said fireworks down the side, and had all these big murals down the side of the building, and I noticed kind of off in the weeds, there was this huge rocket. This dude was like, I'm guessing probably like 30 feet long, okay? I mean, I don't know if I'm... Longer than that. Is it longer than that? <laughs> How long is it? Longer. Maybe 40 feet. Maybe the width Let's of this building. Let's just round it up. It was 35 to 40 feet-ish, okay? The thing was long. It was big, and it was the old sign that they used out in front of this fireworks place. So it had a pole running down the middle of it, and it was it used to be erect standing up in front of this establishment to uh, obviously to, to drive and, and gain awareness for, for the facility. So awesome. I'm thinking, okay, if there's weeds growing around this thing, I said, Misty, check it out. I said, there's no way they want that old rocket. I said, you know, we're in kids ministry. We love illustrations. We love anything that gets attention. I said, Misty, we need that rocket. We need it. And she said, oh my gosh, pull in. So we pull in and we look this rocket over and lo and behold, it, it is a, it, it's okay. Now you can't go to outer space in it, but it is a rocket. Nonetheless, it's an awesome rocket. It's huge. And we got so excited and we thought, okay, okay, when, when we, I don't even know if we were, had we planted the church yet? No, we were. We were still in college, right? No, we were kids pastors at the time and we actually. That's right. We weren't quite sure what we would do with it, but we knew we, we could rocket. do something awesome with a rocket. <laughs> Who doesn't need Who a doesn't rocket, Who doesn't need a right? rocket? Everybody, Everybody needs a rocket. So we actually, you know, we got permission. We went in and we talked to them, got the phone number of the person who owned the old rocket in the weeds. And we asked, you know, could we have the rocket? And guess what they said? Yes. Yes. Now we just had a dilemma on our hands. How would we get, How are the, we rocket gonna get the rocket from Webb City? It was, on, it was the north of Joplin, yeah. Webb City, all the way back to the Keith Farm so that Brandon could refurbish the thing because yes. he didn't know what kind of a project he had on his hands. We were always giving these guys projects to do. And so it never was really a surprise when we called them and said, hey, we've got an idea, right? And then they would be like, oh my, what have they come up with now? I mean, talk about young ministers excited about the ministry. We were on fire and now we have a rocket. <laughs> Woo! 
we just don't know what to do with it, right? So me and my brilliant mind, okay? All right, I was a little new to Misty's family. I grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City. Never really did much hauling before. But I had enough experience around the Keith farm that I had hooked up a trailer from time to time, all right? And so thought, hey, let's just go get Dad's trailer. And let's haul it up to Web City and let's load that rocket, right? So I don't think that in the moment when I was trying to you know, evaluate the situation, I realized how enormous this rocket was, let alone how heavy the rocket was. But me, and again, in my brilliant mind, I, I hooked up the trailer, we took it up to Web City, Misty and I, okay, to Web City to go get a rocket. And so it ended up, you know, because we're just crazy and we work crazy hours around the clock doing ministry, awesome. It was like 11 o'clock at night in North Joplin. Okay, we've got this trailer in a parking lot. In the backed dark. Backed up in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we look like so, thieves. So, Misty and I are excited. I got my straps. I got my trailer, and we have a rocket. So, we get out. We're looking at it. Within about five minutes, I'm scratching my head, and I'm thinking, okay. All right, so here's the plan, honey. All right, so I, in my brute, massive strength, I mean, Samson-type strength that God has blessed me with, obviously, I'm going to lift up the front end of this rocket, and you're going to back the trailer, back the trailer right under it, and the rocket's just going to kind of load itself. It's going to be awesome. So we tried that, and about half an hour later, <laughs> not moving an inch, I was a bit frustrated. And uh, now I didn't cuss, but it came to my mind to maybe try it again. Because I was very frustrated. <laughs> I was covered in sweat. She wasn't helping because she was like, was this your plan? To load a rocket at midnight? Really? Are you serious? And so we're covered in sweat. We're frustrated. So, of course, I have resources, right? My buddies, my pals from Bible college, I get on the phone and say, yo, Phil, get you and your boys, all right? He had this, uh, he's a pastor in Web City. He had this men's house of these guys. Most of them are carpenters and, and all this and that. And I said, hey, bring your boys and let's get this thing loaded. So he's like, dude, it's midnight. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing at midnight? He's like, you got a good point. We'll be there in just a little bit. So he brings a couple guys and about five, 10 minutes into this, they're like, what are you thinking, man? There's no way that you're gonna load this rocket on this trailer, first of all, we can't even lift it. And secondly, the trailer is half the length of the rocket. And like, had you're, flags to like, flag it. You're so negative. The glass is always half empty for people like you. We can do this. He's like, we cannot do this. So very, very, very frustrated because it almost always works out, right? I mean, we always figure out a way. But in this particular case, it was a lost cause. We could not load the rocket. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, if my memory serves me right, we actually got the rocket like a third of the way up on the trailer. And then in our frustration and our disappointment, we had to pull away and just let it drop. Well, because what we were loading onto that trailer was never intended to be on that trailer. You see, the tires started going down and down and down. And I was like, we're going to pop and the my trailer dad's tires like on that. this trailer. <laughs> you got to stop. And so... You know, our motto was always, call my brothers. And so we drove home that yeah. night at like 1 o'clock in the morning, called them up the next day and With said, no rocket. we have to go get this rocket. We have to. So Stan and Brandon, we went with a jack and a larger trailer. And long story short. Big, long goose neck. It was, it awesome. was a bit of a chore, but we loaded that rocket. And if you want to see it, it's at the Keith Farm today. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> no. We are going to use We are going to use that rocket. We're going to use, gonna use that rocket. After it's all that. It's going to be out here in front of this church as soon as I reel my yeah. dad into concreting that yes. sucker into the ground. We're going to set that dude in the ground. We're going to paint it, and we're going to say, like, like blast off, blast. blast off with us. Right. Kid explosion Wednesday nights. We always we use the things that we work so we're hard gonna for. We're going to use the rocket. <laughs> we will use the rocket. Anyway, nonetheless, we left that night very, very, very frustrated. Very 
discouraged and very frustrated because we were trying to cause this trailer to carry something that it was never intended to carry. And today, there might be many of us that are trying to carry things on our plates, carry things on our shoulders, weighing down on our mind, on our emotions, things that God never intended us for us to carry around. And today, we're going to talk to you about those things. We're going to bring you an encouraging word. Pray with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, and it says this. Therefore, now, if you study the Word of God, you will begin to understand that when you see a word like therefore, you have to read the chapter before to even understand what they were talking about. So we're going to back up in a minute, but I'm going to finish this passage. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on who? Jesus, Jesus the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. When you begin to get overloaded and weighted down, you can always go to the Word of God for wisdom. And when we go to this passage, we begin to see that God never intended us to carry so much weight. Okay, so we're going to help you to understand what do we do with it, but let's deal with the therefore, okay? If you go, and I'm going to turn right to it, because the chapter before in Hebrews chapter 11, it's known as the faith chapter. If you've ever read it, it is all about these incredible men and women of God who did awesome things. How many's ever heard of Noah? What did Noah do? Noah built an ark. Noah built an ark. Do you realize when Noah built an ark, it had never, ever rained? Now listen to me. You think we were crazy getting a rocket. Noah built a huge, ginormous ark the size of a football field, if that gives you some perspective, okay? The size of a football field when never had it rained in all of that time. So as he began to do it, what did people say? You have lost your mind, dude. And he's like, no, God told me to build an ark. God told me to build an ark. I'm just going to keep me and my boys. That's why God gives you kids, man. You just reel your kids into that kind of stuff. Me and my boys, we're going to build an ark. How many's ever heard of a guy named Abraham? A guy who waited 25 years to have his first child, and he had his son when he was what? 100 years old. How many's ready to go have a child at 100? How about Jacob? How about Joseph? A dude that had a coat of many colors who went from the pit to the palace. These are men and women who we look at in the, in the Old Testament, and their stories are so crazy that you read them and you're like, that's just made up. There's no way that stuff happened. And yet it did. Moses, you remember Moses? The children of Israel who, who walked around the wall of Jericho seven times until it fell down. A prostitute by the name of Rahab who was used to as help the Israelites defeat the land of Jericho. A guy named Gideon who honestly went to battle and was so scared out of his mind because God said, I want you to go up against this people group. And he said, but you got too many men and women with you. He said, I want you to send everybody home who's scared. Wow. If you're going to battle and you send home the ones who are scared, guess how many he had left? 300. He had 300 and God said, go out there on the mountaintop and surround surround them. The other, the other army was down in the valley. He said, surround them up there. Take a pitcher and take a trumpet. And what I want you to do is I want you to blow the trumpet and break the pitchers. And I'm going to deliver that army into your hands. Where's the guns? Where's the swords? Oh, you're not taking them. Don't need them. Why? Because God's going to deliver that army into your hands. The crazy stuff that you read in the Old Testament by men and women of faith, and when you read that passage in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, and by faith, Abraham, and by faith, Noah, and by faith, Enoch, and by faith, Moses, and by faith, the children of Israel. You see, there's nothing we will ever do in this life that we'll do without faith. And so when you begin to look at this passage, he says, therefore, therefore, since all these incredible men and women of God have by faith accomplished, <clears throat> excuse me, accomplished so much, he says, we're now surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses. Now, here's the deal. 
He's not saying that these people are in heaven looking down on you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the example has already been set before you. You can look back in the word of God and you can say, God, you told me to plant a church. This is insane. And he says, go back and look at what I ask other people to do. I ask Noah to build an ark. I ask Moses to wait 25 years to have a kid when he was 100. I ask Moses to go deliver the children of Israel who had been in bondage for 400 years. We are surrounded by such incredible examples of the faith. Now, I want to read you a passage. They may not have it upstairs, but I'm going to read this to you. Hebrews chapter 11, the last two verses say this. Now, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. Why in the world would they not have received all that God had promised? They were amazing. He says, For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Listen to me. Do you know what they were missing? All these people were such incredible men and women of faith, yet there was something missing in their walk. You know what it was? Jesus Christ had not came on the scene yet. Jesus Christ had not came. He had not lived. He had not died for their sins. They did not have that relationship of being able to call upon the name of Jesus in their moment of stress. No, they did not have that. And so it says they had not received all that God had promised. But guess who has? We have. We have received all that God has promised. So then when you begin to look at this passage that we're looking at today, it says, since we are surrounded by all of these amazing examples, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. See, here's the deal. In this Christian walk, in this life of the believer, God never intended us to say, I want to accept you into my life. I want you to come in and forgive me of my sins. And then you don't go forward. Can you imagine if you were to go to a race and you were at the starting line, right? You register for the race. You go, man, you get the, you get the outfit. I can just see it now, right? You, you register for the race, this 5K. Everybody's into 5Ks right now, aren't they? They're so cool. I haven't yet because I'm not sure I want to run. But I would love to go shopping and get the outfit then like go and register and get my name like on me and the number and you look cool. You can take a selfie and then just not run. But you go to the starting line and you get on the starting line and you're like, yes, they get down like they're ready. They're going to do this whole track thing. I never ran track. But you get down and you're like ready to go. And they like blast that horn and you don't move. You did everything up until the point of the race. But when the race starts, how ridiculous would it be if you're standing here and it's like, boom, and everybody takes off. And you're like still at the starting line. That would be insane, wouldn't it? Here's the deal. When we accept Christ into our life, he expects us to get going in this race. We begin to move, making progress in our faith every day, growing, learning about him, growing. Yeah, you're going to hit a bump. Yes, you're going to fall flat on your face, and you're not going to stay down. You're going to get yourself back up. But he expects us to keep on going. But imagine if you try to do that with a whole bunch of junk, weights that God never intended you to carry. See, he tells us we can strip off those weights. So what are the weights? What are the weights that we're carrying in this life, Brad? Well, you know, when, when, when you give your life to Christ, Satan immediately goes to work trying to weigh you down. From the moment maybe you're in the sanctuary on a, a Sunday morning or maybe you're watching online and you give your life to Christ, I want to tell you from that very second, Satan begins his work to try to weigh you down because he does not want you to cross the finish line. You have to remember that in this life, you have to walk out your faith with Christ, but you also have a destiny, a plan, and a purpose. And ultimately, heaven as your home is the greatest reward that we have to look to. And continually, Satan is trying to weigh you down with stuff. And a lot of times, Satan doesn't have anything to do with it at all. A lot of times, we do it to ourselves. What, what I want to share with you this morning is that when you're weighed down, God doesn't want you to hold on to it. You weren't intended to carry the weight on your shoulders. Basically, the frustration of circumstances, right? And that those it may come from circum those frustrations may come from circumstances or from people. But then the other thing that weighs us down is temptation or sin. And boy, does it ever weigh us down. 
it, doesn't it just seem like the more and more you try, the harder you fight, that the more you really try to live for God, the harder it gets sometimes? Now, I, I want to tell you that that's, that's normal. I mean, I mean, if it's normal for us to fight this good fight of faith. It's normal for us to, to come up against obstacles and challenges. We all have them. Every one of those heroes of the faith that the Word talks about in chapter 11 in Hebrews, man, they had obstacles. They all had struggles. They had challenges. They had frustrations. But what separates us between the men and the boys is that God wants us to unload. He wants us to not carry those things because they hinder us and they slow us down. That's right. So you ask yourself, well, then how do we unload? I mean, it's easy if you're literally unloading a truck or you're unloading. You know, at our house, every time we come home, we have four children. And if you have four children or you have one, you know that when they go to the car, they like load a whole bunch of junk that you don't need. I mean, even if you're running to like Walmart, they've got all this junk that makes it to the car. So every time we get home, Brad and I say the classic, all right, everybody, unload the car. And they're like, oh, we just want to get out and we just want to go in. Because it looks like someone's been living in it for six months <laughs> and we just went to town and came every back. Time, yeah, every seriously. time. Yeah, seriously. There's clothes, there's food, there's all this stuff. And so we're like, unload it, unload it. Well, here's the deal. Unloading is not always the easiest thing to do. Ignoring it would be easier, but the problem is if I ignored all the junk that my children pile into our car, then eventually we, the people who, who it's supposed to move, would not be able to fit into the car. The very reason it was created, it would not be able to fulfill its purpose to transport the Helton family, the clan of Heltons that need to go from point A to point B, all because we didn't take the time to unload. And does it take time? It does. It takes us about five minutes at the end of any trip to unload. However, if we let it get backed up, follow me, okay? I'm going somewhere. If we let it get backed up, you go a week and don't clean out your car, I bet I can go to the parking lot and find Ooh. some, right? If you go a week and don't clean out your car, it's going to take more time. Yes. It's going to take more time to clean up the mess that you have not unloaded throughout that week. It's going to begin to stink. It's going to begin to get nasty. You're going to need gonna a be chisel. Dirty clothes. You're going to need a chisel. You're going to need a trash Some bleach. can. <laughs> Who knows? It's going to be a tough go, but here's the deal. How do we unload the weight that God never intended us to carry? It's really simple, and yet why do we not do it? It's prayer. God never intended us to carry the heavy weight of circumstances and frustrations that we face in this life. Sometimes we bring them on ourselves, and sometimes there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. Sometimes it's just how life is. Somebody gets sick in your family, you have to step up to the plate and handle that. You have to every day unload that stress. You have to every day come to the Father and say, God, I was never intended to carry this heavy burden, and I'm going to give it to you. I want to share a story, and I bet you've heard it, but I may have missed this one little verse in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 8. This is an awesome story. Have you ever heard of King David? King David was a warrior. He was an incredible warrior. And he actually, the Bible says that, I mean, you go back and you read it when he first came into the kingdom. It was like Saul the king has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. David spent his life, even as a king, in the battle. Well, this is a story where David has been out, and he and his guys had been out in a battle, and they come back to their camp to find that someone had been there and raided their camp, okay? What they find is not good. Listen to this story. It says this. Three days later, when David and his men arrived home at the town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid and they had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everything else, but without killing anyone. Now just pause. This circumstance is just something that happened to these men, okay? They're out doing what they did. They're out fighting the battles. That's what they did. That was like their day job, if you will. And they come home at night to find that their women, all their wives, and all their kids were gone. And everything that they owned and had worked so hard for, all their livestock, it's all gone. Now, I want you to just imagine in today's, okay, in today's thought, you come home to your house and you've been robbed. 
Not only have they taken all your things, but they've taken your family as well. You just imagine the load that you would feel in that moment and what would you do? Okay, think about this. Now listen to what David does. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they couldn't weep no more. They just bawled their eyes out. It goes on to say David had two wives that were in that camp and they were captured. David was now in great danger. Guess why he was in great danger? David was the leader. So guess who everybody turns on when things go bad? The leader. David was in great danger because all of his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Listen to this. Oh, my goodness. This is what, if you have a Bible and you highlight in it, you should highlight in it. It says, Then he said to Abathar the priest, Bring me the ephod. An ephod was like a shaw that would go over their shoulders and over their head when they prayed that we got in Israel. But it went over the shoulders and over their head. He said, bring it to me. Then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Now we can read that story and be like, oh yeah, that was cool. No, you don't get it. Listen to me. Here's the deal. David had lost everything he had ever worked for. He lost his entire family. He lost all of his possessions. He lost everyone that he loved, okay? His friends. Now all of his friends are turning on him, and they're ready to stone him. You talk about pressure. He probably felt like on the inside, I want to roll over and die at this moment. I can't go on. God, why would you do this to me? I'm doing your work. I was out in battle doing what you told me to do. Now I come back and everything that I've ever worked for is gone. Do you know what David did? David did not get angry. David did not start screaming at God. David did not start falling apart in front of everybody. David got on his face, covered his head with an ephod, and said, right in the middle of a horrible circumstance and battle, I'm going to have a prayer meeting. I'm going to get on my face. I'm going to find out what God has to say about this. Guess why? Because he was never intended to carry that weight on his shoulders. He could not have known what was about to happen. There was no way, but guess who did? God Almighty. In every single situation in our life, God already knows. God knows the answer that you need right now. God knows you don't have the money to pay your bills. God knows what the diagnosis said. God already knows. But what we do is we get stressed out on ourselves. Well, I got to go make more money. I got to figure out. I got I got to figure it out. And yet the Bible says we can't figure out anything. But it says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This last passage I want to share with you this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. It says this, Give all your worries and your cares to God, for He cares about you. I want you to think about this. When your child, if you're, if you're a parent, and your kid comes running up to you, and they're distressed, okay? Something, and it, if it's a kid, it's probably something minor. But our kids all the time, there's a problem that they come running to us to solve. And guess what? It might be something simple. Something's broken. They can't get something to work. And what do you do? Hey, calm down. I hope that's what you do. It's okay. Let me go help you. Let me go fix it for you. I've been down this road before. I can figure this out. We can do it. When we come to God with our worries and our cares and our stress and all the weights of this world, God is our Father. He adopted you and I into His family when you accepted that free gift of salvation. And He says, hey, this is cake. You're like, no, it's not. I don't have whatever. I don't have my bills. My wife has left me. Everything's falling apart. He's like, it's okay. We're going to take care of it. But here's the deal. God wants to put His hand on your shoulder, and He wants to, in the Spirit, say, it's going to be okay. But He can't do that if we don't first come to him and unload. And oftentimes, we're so busy. We're so busy, guys. We're so busy in today's culture. You know, all the awesome toys we have, years ago, before these things were all created, the cell phones and the iPhones and the iPads and all the technology, they believed that we would have so much more time on our hands because of all the tools that we would have. But what they found out, and I've read statistics on this, 
is that now because we have all these tools in our hands, we have even less time because we get so distracted with our tools, with our toys, if you will. They're supposed to be tools. But here's the deal. We oftentimes don't just take the time to do the very simple things. And I'll tell you, as your pastors, we'll be transparent. You know, we lead a busy life. And I have to make myself take the time to keep my priorities straight. And when life gets overwhelming, I get on my face. And it might only be five or ten minutes. And all of a sudden, God begins to give me clear direction. And it's like, you got it. This is it. Get up. Wipe it off. Shake it off. Get up and go do whatever God has told you to do. It's going to be okay. But we shortcut ourselves and our families whenever we don't first stop and just unload. So what I have in my hand here is, is called a tallit. And in the Hebrew culture, this is better known as a prayer shawl. And the Hebrew men will carry this over their shoulders. Will you help me out, my love? They'll carry this over their shoulders when they commit to, to prayer. And so this is very similar to the concept behind what occurred when David just dropped everything and said, let's pray. And he called for the ephod, which was a different piece, but the principle is still the same. He called for a time of prayer. And as the Hebrew culture just kind of uh, evolved throughout time, they, they came up with this, with this tool that's symbolic of just the covering of God's presence to cover you as you're praying. And, and, and what the Hebrew men will do is they will cover their head like this when they when they pray so that it's just them and God. So it's like their prayer closet. They're literally covering themselves away from the world and it's just them and God and they're taking their needs before him. And so what I think is so powerful about this is that when when you begin to ask yourself the question, what things are weighing me down in my life right now? What frustrations are weighing me down? What people, what circumstances, what sin, what temptation, what is is keeping me and slowing me from becoming Becoming the person that God wants to be me to be and when we begin to realize and identify what those things are then we have to take that step that initiative to take it to prayer and say God I give it to you I give it to you and so today I want to ask you the question what load are you carrying what load are you carrying what is on your shoulders what is slowing you down what is weighing you down is it a person? Is it unforgiveness? Is it your relationship with God? Maybe you have, have really just kind of fallen away from that great relationship that you used to have. Maybe there's temptations that you're just struggling with and you just can't seem to overcome. You know, maybe it's, it's a relationship is, issue with, with your spouse. Maybe it's, maybe it's with your children, just not knowing really how to raise them the way you want to. Maybe it's financial issues. Maybe it's, it's in your mind. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's even ministry. Do you know that, that ministry can be frustrating even though you're trying to do the things of God? You're trying to love people and it gets frustrating. Misty and I can, can vouch for that. Ministry can be frustrating. There's opportunities everywhere you turn for that load to get heavier and heavier and heavier. But what I, what I want to tell you today is the only load that God wants you to carry is the burden to pray. He wants you to unload everything else. The only thing you should be carrying is the responsibility to take it to prayer. We say this, and in, in our culture around this church, with our leadership, with our staff, we say, worry about nothing, pray about everything. We worry about nothing, we pray about everything. What is on your shoulders right now? My response to you would be, God doesn't want it there. The enemy would slow you down. That's his will, that's his plan, that's his desire. But God's will is that you would lay it at his feet and totally and completely surrender it and give it to him. What are you carrying? What load are you carrying this morning on your shoulders? I want that question to sink deep into your head, into your heart this morning. What load are you carrying that God did not intend for you to carry? It could be a... It could be your relationship with God. Maybe you, maybe you have just fallen back. Maybe you have lost ground in your relationship with God. You know that weighs you down. Maybe, maybe your marriage relationship is struggling and that weighs you down. Maybe you're having financial challenges right now in your life. That weighs you down. Maybe you have relationship issues. Maybe it's within the body of Christ. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's a neighbor. Whatever it is. Do you know that so many times 
if we allow frustration of unforgiveness to weigh on our hearts, man, life just happens, and sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes we have frustrations with one another. But God wants us to mend the fences. God wants us to make it right immediately. He doesn't want us to sweep it under the rug. He doesn't want us to harbor that frustration because that, heart, that, that frustration leads to bitterness. And that bitterness leads to poison. And it becomes toxic and it grows like a cancer and it festers inside of you. Until, what, until the outcome is something that you do not want to see take place in your life and it brings devastation and destruction not only to your life but to someone else's do you know that unforgiveness is one of the most common things that weighs us down you can't run the race that God has called you to you can't be the person that God has called you to be you can't have the destiny that he's given you if you have unforgiveness in your heart towards any person I'm telling you right now it could be issues with your uh, you could have challenges with your children that's weighing you down you could have challenges with your mind, just emotional challenges. You could have time management challenges. You could have challenges in ministry. Did you know that sometimes ministry can breed frustration? I bet that would have never crossed your mind. Misty and I constantly and continually are faced with opportunity to grow frustrated because of ministry. You want to know why? Because there's people in it. Right? The world would be perfect if there was no people. <laughs> But because there is, we just kind of have to make this work, right? And so we're constantly, constantly faced with opportunities to lighten the load. What are you carrying this morning? I want to tell you, now is your moment. Right now is your time. Whether you're in this church building under the sound of my voice or you're watching online, I want to tell you right now, this is your time to walk free, to walk free with that heavy load completely and totally lifted off of you. How many of you guys would just be honest this morning and say, I need a refreshing of God's presence and His power in my life. I need healing in relationships, in physical body, in finances. I need God to lift the load off of my back. How many of you guys would be honest this morning and raise your hand if that's you? Amen. Well, here's what I want to do this morning. I knew that's what the response would be. We're going to open up these altars, and we are going to lay these down at the feet of God. Before I invite you to come up, I want to tell you a quick story. Again, when Misty and I were in college, and we were doing a college ministry that traveled around at different churches, and we ministered with a team of college students. And I'll never forget this drama that this girl in our group did, and, and it was so awesome. It was a monologue. She, she, she walks down the aisle of the church with a bunch of suitcases just loaded down with all this junk that she'd been carrying around and she lays herself down at the altar she starts unzipping these baggages and she starts unloading all of these things at the altar and she's just pouring her heart out she's just laying all these things out at the feet of God all these things she's laying at his feet and as she begins to wrap up her conversation with God she just gradually begins to repack everything back into the suitcase while she's completing her vent. And then she just thanks God as her suitcases again are fully packed. She thanks God for listening. And she gets up and she walks off and she takes all the baggage with her. How many times do we do that? How many times do we just want to complain about circumstances rather than giving it to Jesus and really truly unloading everything at his feet you know the Bible talks about a, a passage of scripture and, and it talks about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into heaven and it says it's, it's as hard as a camel entering into the eye of the needle and, and it didn't mean literally trying to fit a camel through the eye of a needle it was fitting the camel through the eye of the needle, which was a triangular hole in the city wall, which means it was possible for the camel to get through the hole. But what the camel had to do is the camel had to kneel down on all fours, and then the, the rider had to unpack all of the junk that was on the camel's back because the hole was only big enough for him alone to fit through. And that's what that passage is talking about, but it also relates 
to unloading our frustrations before the Father. The only way you can really run this race in life, the only way you can really move forward and mature in Christ is to come to the altar literally and, and unload everything and give it to Him. And then you can pass through. You can win the race. God has given you the victory. He's given you the finish line. But you've got to unload. This morning, if you would, if you have some unloading to do, I want you just to step out of your seat. I want you to find a place right here and unload your things to God. Will you come this morning? I saw all, the, all those of you who raised your hand. Hey, come on. We are a family this morning. God has a, an appointed moment in time right now to minister to your heart. And there's something significant spiritually that happens. There's a shift that happens in the spirit when you get up and when you step out of your seat because you're saying, God, I don't care what people think. I am, I am taking a step forward to say, I totally, completely trust that you are able to do this thing. It's a symbol of release. It's a symbol of saying, God, I am trusting you. I know that you can do this thing. Will you come this morning? Will you just come this morning and unload before the Father? those of you that are watching online this morning, we want to tell you as well, go to the Father right now in prayer. We're praying and agreeing with you right now. Just, just take all of that junk that's on your shoulders and just unload it before you. Cast your cares on Jesus, for He cares for you. If you don't know Jesus today, I want to encourage you to come to know Him in a real way. It's as easy as admitting in your heart that you have fallen short of the glory of God and believing in your heart that He is the only way to heaven and confessing with your mouth that He is Lord, dedicating from this moment forward that you're going to live for Him according to His Word, that you're going to commit to His kingdom and run the race that He's called you to live just like we were talking about today. My prayer is that today you will make that decision. We love you so much. Let me conclude in a final prayer. God, we are just so grateful for your wonderful presence in this place today, God. I thank you, God, for your timely word. Thank you, God, for touching and changing hearts today that we might leave this place different than the way we came, Father God. Just, I imagine in my mind people leaving today, people walking away from this message, Father God, without any burdens, without any weights on their shoulders, weights that they were not intended to carry. I see people walking away free and refreshed, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope and pray that today's word that Brad and I delivered was encouraging and life-changing. You know, our hope and desire is that every single week we can bring practical, life-changing messages to you and others just like you who need encouragement. And you can help us make that a reality with your giving. The Bible tells us in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You know, this is the only place in the entire word of God that he tells us we can put him to the test, and it's in our giving. I'm telling you, it's been a part of my life, and I have never been able to outgive God, and he always provides. And we want to extend to you that same opportunity. Try it. Test God in your giving and see if God won't pour out a blessing upon you and your household. There's two easy ways to give. The easiest is text giving. All you have to do is text the number 918-223-8090 and follow the prompts to give. It's that easy. You can also send a check or a money order to Mountain Movers Church at 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. We hope to see you again next week as we bring another life-changing message into your home.